God began in January of 1901 when a company of people under the leadership of Charles Palm, who was studying God's word in Topeka, Kansas, decided to lay aside all commentaries and all notes and wait on the Lord. And what they did not understand, they got down on their knees and they asked God to illuminate in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. They had a prayer tower from which prayers would ascend night and day to God. After three months, a sister felt led by the Holy Spirit to have hands laid on her that she might receive the Pentecost. And as soon as they prayed, the Holy Ghost came in full power, and she commenced to speak in an unknown tongue. This made all the Bible school hungry. And three nights afterwards, 12 students received the Holy Ghost. They prophesied and cloven tongues could be seen upon their heads. They had an experience that measured up with the second chapter of Acts. Now, Brother Palm began teaching the baptism of the Holy Ghost and eventually moved his school and his ministry to Houston, Texas. But that's not where the great uproar happened, nah. -uh. It happened five years after his first students experienced Pentecost in the most unlikely of places with the most unlikely saint you would ever imagine. Son of the impoverished, emancipated slaves, meek as a lamb, but humble as pie, William J. Seymour. In 1905, I had moved to Houston, Texas to join my family. It is there I came upon a small holiness church pastored by Lucy Farrell, the niece of the famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Amen! Praise God! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Glory! Amen. It was Lucy who first spoke to me about Brother Parle. His teaching on the working of the Holy Spirit greatly intrigued me. So I had asked him if I could join his new Bible school. <laughs> Brother Parle agreed. <laughs> but due to the segregation laws, I could not sit in the classroom with the other white students. I was, however, permitted to listen outside through an open door. I hadn't been in the school long before I was utterly convinced that there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit for every believer. I hadn't received it, but I began to earnestly seek it. Now, I arrived in Los Angeles, California with my wife and two daughters, the eldest three and one half years old, on December 22nd, 1904. Now, little Esther, our oldest daughter, was seized with convulsions and passed away to be with Jesus January 7th. Well, little Esther's death had, had broken my heart. And I felt I could only live while in God's service. A great burden and cry came into my heart for a mighty revival. And many were similarly being prepared at this time at different parts of the world. See, God was preparing to visit and deliver his people once more. Yeah. You know, most believers find it easier to criticize than to pray. But my summer, my life, by, by that summer of 1905, was literally swallowed up in prayer. Yeah. By the fall of 1906, yeah. I could scarcely sleep for the spirit of prayer. Yeah. Then February, February of 1906, after a service, seven of us seemed providentially led to join hands and ask the Lord to pour out His Spirit speedily with signs following. Yes. Where we got this idea from, I do not know. I mean, he must have himself suggested it to us. We did not have tongues in mind. I think none of us ever heard of such a thing. Well, it was a divine call that brought me from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles. The Lord put in the heart of some saint to write to me saying that the Lord would have me come over here to do a work. And so I came because I felt that it was the leading of the Lord. Well, the Lord sent the means, so I, I left that new Bible school, and I took charge of a mission on Santa Fe Street.
they were all filled with the Spirit. As the Spirit gave them utterance, they began speaking in other tongues. Brothers and sisters, this can also happen to us today. What, well, what did he say? That's nonsense. The man's a heretic. No, I, heretic. I, I, I hadn't received the gift of speaking in tongues, but, but I believed it. And I preached it because it was right there in the Word. Well, they certainly didn't appreciate that. The next morning when I arrived at the church for Bible study, they bolted the door shut to keep me out. I was left with no church and no place to stay. So I invited Brother Seymour to come stay with us. I wanted to hear more about the things he was talking about, and so did others. So we started a Bible study in the living room, and it grew quickly. <laughs> Soon we needed more space. So we moved the meeting over to Richard and Ruth Asbury's home at 214 Bonnie Bray Street. March 26th, I went to a prayer meeting on Bonnie Bray Street. Both white and color saints were meeting there for prayer, and they were very earnestly seeking for an outpouring. And there was Brother Seymour, who had just come from Texas. He was a colored man, very plain, spiritual, and humble, and he was blind in one eye. I sent word to Miss Lucy Farrell to join us in Los Angeles to give testimony of her baptism with the Spirit. She was my first encounter with somebody who had experienced it, and I knew she could help the people understand it better. We entered into a 10-day fast, determined to get more from God. But three days later, I wasn't feeling too well. So Brother Seymour stopped by to pray, and as soon as he laid his hands on me, instantly I felt better. Encouraged by this, I further asked Brother Seymour to pray that I might receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord. Ah, to my shock, Edward started speaking in tongues. It was as if God had opened wide a faucet on his insides. And the, the Lord came bursting out the Holy Spirit. We were ecstatic. I couldn't control myself. Ooh. Well, I walked over a short while to Bonnie Bray, where I held a prayer meeting. And I started that prayer meeting with a song of praise. Hallelujah, Lord. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountain through the deep vale. Jesus has said I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. the second chapter of Acts, and I preached a sermon that none of us would ever forget. Amen. Then they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and started speaking in other tongues. Yes! As the scriptures were spoken, Edward lifted his hands and we all heard him speak forth loud praise in a language that sounded nothing like English. We fell to our knees in joy and soon it happened to everybody else. We were all speaking in tongues. Not only that, but I, I sat down on the piano, which I had never learned, and started playing as if I'd been doing so from childhood. Oh my God. <laughs> Hallelujah! Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, lighting my soul. And soon you had people of every color and every social Sophia come into the house. Whites, blacks, young, old, Mexican, it didn't matter. The Spirit of God was drawing in from people from every tribe and tongue to pour out this yes, blessing. Lord. My God, my God. The living room became too small mighty quickly. So the front porch of that itty bitty house on Bonnie Bray became Brother Seymour's pulpit. Glory to God. Oh, and the streets? It was packed with hungry souls. 
One night there were so many people on that porch that the whole of it collapsed. Whoa. Woo. <laughs> A larger space was needed to accommodate the crowds, and the Lord led Brother Seymour to 312 Azusa Street. The place was a mess. It was a wretched sight to behold. The building was in a very undesirable part of town. It had one time been a church, but it had barely survived a fire. Now it was just used for storage and a stable for horses. Well, I was the straw boss at McNeil Construction Company, and I hired a crew of co-workers to come down and clear the debris. But this is what made Azusa different. While we were there initially just to do cleanup, we met with several black women who came and prayed over the work workers. One of them, a Roman Catholic, fell to his knees amidst the rubble and burst into tears. Hallelujah. This is remembered as the first move of the Spirit at Azusa Missions. And the meetings were yet to begin. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The building measured 40 to 60 feet, tight enough for approximately 600 to 800 people who would regularly fit in. At times, an additional 400 would squeeze around the outside of the windows and doors, and it was hot. Ooh, smelly. Pesky flies everywhere. And that summer of 1906 was hotter than usual. Mm. Two large wooden boxes were stacked on top of one another. That was my pulpit. You wouldn't expect any type of heavenly visitations there unless you remember the stable at Bethlehem. Amen. We praised God for the old barn-like building on Azusa Street and the plain old plank beside which we knelt yes, we in sawdust yes, as God saved, sanctified, and baptized us with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Those who knew God, they felt his presence as soon as they crossed the threshold. Hallelujah. Worshippers gathered in a new way. Brother Seymour put the pulpit in the middle of the room and the worshippers gathered around him. <laughs> All were on the same level and equal. Brother Seymour did this because each person was a potential participant in what was happening. Amen. There was no quiet to look at, no audience. All were invited to take part. As people felt moved, they would share scriptures and testimonies and give words of encouragement. There was nothing like it. On Tuesday night, April 17th, just a little over a week after the outpouring began, News spread far and wide over all Los Angeles. Even the Los Angeles Times showed up to see what was happening. LA Times, April 18th, 1906. A weird babble of tongues. Breathing strange utterances and melting creed to which it would seem no mere mortal could understand, the newest religious sect has started in Los Angeles. Meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street, and old colored exhorter, blind in one eye, is the major domo of the company. Clasped in his big fist, he holds a miniature Bible from which he reads at intervals one or two words, never more. After an hour spent in exhortation, the brethren present are invited to join in a meeting of prayer, song, and testimony. And then it is that the pandemonium breaks loose by those who are filled with the Spirit, whatever that may be. One speaker had a vision in which he saw the people of Los Angeles flocking in a mighty stream to perdition. He prophesied, he prophesied awful destruction to the city unless its citizens are brought to a belief in the tenets of the new faith. The article appeared on April 18th, same day as the great San Francisco earthquake. The entire city began to tremble and quake. It was like the sound of 10,000 roaring lions. That quake was followed by massive fires that destroyed over 28,000 buildings, killed 3,000 people, and left a quarter of a million homeless. God was calling the people to repent and be filled. Still, there was much persecution, especially from the press. Oh, they wrote us up shamefully, but this only drew the crowds. Right. Some gave the work six months to live, but yeah. soon the meetings were running day and night. I mean, the place was packed out nightly, and there were far more white people than colored coming now. The color line was washed Woo! away in the blood. Woo! My God, today, you see, God makes no difference in nationality. Oh, no, yeah. he doesn't. Ethiopians, Amen. Chinese, yeah. Mexicans, yeah. Indians, yeah. and all other nationalities worship together. Glory to God. Everybody was just the same. It did not matter if you were black, white, green, or grizzly. It was a wonderful spirit. Black and whites. Germans and Jews, they ate together at a little Amen. cottage at the rear. Amen. Nobody ever thought of color. Amen. Our colored brethren must love our white brethren. Amen. 
and respect them in yeah. the truth Hallelujah. so that the word of God can have its free course. Yes. Yes. Our white brethren yes. must love our colored brethren Amen. and respect them in the truth yes. so that the Holy Spirit won't be grieved. Yes. Many churches have been praying for Pentecost, and Pentecost has come. The question is now, will they accept it? Yes. God is coming away they did not look for. Oh LA Times, September 1906. Disgraceful intermingling of the races. They cry and make howling noises all day and into the night. They run, they jump, shake all over, shout at the top of their voices, spin around in circles, kicking, rolling, and, sh and, and falling out on the sawdust blanketed floor. Some of them pass out and do not move for hours as though, they as though they're dead. Some of these people appear to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. They claim to be filled with the Spirit, but they have a one-eyed, illiterate Negro as their preacher who stays on his knees much of the time with his head hidden between two milk crates. He doesn't talk very much, but times can be heard shouting, repent, and he's supposed to be the one leading the thing. They repeatedly sing the same song, the Comforter has come. share testimonies of what had been happening at Azusa. That September, we started with approximately 5,000 copies, and within a few months, the publication grew to 50,000 and was shipped all over the country. No bills were ever posted to advertise the meetings. No church organization stood at the back of it. Meetings would begin at 10 in the morning and would hardly stop before 10 or 12 at night, sometimes two or three in the morning, because so many were seeking and some were slain under the power of God. Now the fire was kindling all over the city and surrounding towns. Proud, well-dressed preachers would come in to investigate, but soon their high looks were replaced with wonder. And then conviction comes. And not too soon after, you'll find them wallowing on the dirty floor, asking God for forgiveness and to make them like little children. In that old, run-down building with the low rafters and bare floors, God took strong men and women to pieces and put them together again for His glory. Oh, conviction was mightily on the people. I mean, they would fall to pieces even on the street, almost without provocation. I mean, there, there seemed to be a very dead line drawn around Azusa Mission by the Spirit. Yeah. When men came within two or three blocks of the place, they were seized with conviction. Oh, Hallelujah! Oh, I have learned that the depth of our repentance Jesus. will determine the depth of our revival. Yes. Our Brother Seymour was the leader of the movement under God. He is the meekest man I have ever met. My the God. man walks and talks with yeah. God. Yeah. His strength is in his weakness. Yeah. The man is so... He, he's got this helpless dependence on God, yes. yet is as simple-hearted as a little child. Yes. At the same time, he's so filled with God uh -huh. that you feel love and power every time you step near the man. Yes. Brother Seymour generally sat behind two empty wooden boxes, one on top of the other. He usually had his head inside the top one during the meetings and prayer. There was no pride there. God was working mightily. God was working mightily. Amen. Who am I speaking to? God was working mightily. It seemed that everyone had to come to Azusa. Missionaries came from Africa, India, and the islands of the sea. Preachers and workers crossed the continent 
and came from distant islands with an irresistible draw to Los Angeles. We even had a tarrying room upstairs for those especially seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. My God, although many got it sitting in the main assembly room as well, in their seats, kind of like you are right now today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. On the wall of the tarrying room, there was a placard. And on the placard it said, no one talking above a whisper. You see, an unquiet spirit or a thoughtless talker was immediately reproved by the spirit. Amen. Because we were on holy ground. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And as suddenly as on the day of Pentecost, I was sitting some 12 feet in front of the preacher. And the Holy Spirit fell upon me and my filled God, me up God, literally. I seemed to be lifted in the air for I was in the air shouting, praise God. Praise God. And I started to speak in another language. Oh, I could not have been more surprised if in that very moment someone had walked up to me and handed me a million dollars. No subjects or sermons were announced ahead of time and no special speakers. No one knew what might be coming, what God would do. Somebody might be speaking and suddenly the spirit would fall. God himself would give the altar call. Men all over the house would fall like the slain in battle or rush to the altar on mass to seek God. God was in his holy temple. The whole place was steeped in prayer and the presence of the Lord was so real. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As many as nine services were held in one day, Lord, have mercy. They continue day and night. Azusa was open for three straight years, 24 hours a day. Whoa. And in the beginning, there was no piano, not even a hymn book. They would sing on impulse, a spontaneous singing in the spirit, as if suddenly singing alongside a heavenly choir would bring a presence, a shimmering of God's presence throughout the whole entire room. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Many have had their eyesight perfectly restored. And the deaf, they've had their hearing restored. Glory to God. My, my, my. There was a little girl who had tuberculosis of the bones, as the doctors declared. Yeah, she walked around with crutches. And when she got healed, she dropped her crutches and began to skip about the yard. My God, today. Yes. A man from the central part of Mexico, an Indian, was present at one of the meetings. And he heard a German sister speaking in his tongue. He understood it. And through the message that God gave him through her, he was so happily converted that he could hardly contain his joy. The only English he knew was Jesus Christ and hallelujah. This rough Indian, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, was led to lay hands on a woman in the congregation. And she was suffering from consumption. And as soon as he laid his hands on her, instantly she was healed and arose, and she testified. <laughs> One brother, George Hawk, was stone blind for a year and a half. He was then saved and received his sight. And all his friends who were unbelieving are filled with wonder and are publishing everywhere. Woo! Sister E. Thomas came in for the healing of her wrist, oh, yeah. which had been broken, the bones so out of place, and it was stiff, it was so painful. As soon as they started to offer prayer, let me tell you, you could see the Lord working in her wrist. She was moving the bones back into place, and when he was done, it was perfect. She could bend it without pain. Sister Lemon of Whittier, who had been a sufferer for 18 years and could receive no help from physicians and had been bedridden for 14 years of that time, has been marvelously healed of the Lord through the laying on of hands and the prayer of faith. 
she is now walking the meetings. Hallelujah. The opposers of this work cannot deny that a notable miracle has been performed in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. By the end of 1909, the walls of Azusa Mission would be filled with canes, crutches, and braces of people who have been healed. There are no routine offerings during services. Instead, we just nailed large tin boxes, tin mailboxes on the wall. And they had a sign above them which said these four simple words. Settle with the Lord. Amen. God was always providing for our needs. And I never denied anyone who was truly in need. We cannot tell how many people have been saved Woo! and sanctified yes. and baptized Woo! and even healed of all manner of sickness. My Woo! God, my God, my God. Many are speaking in new tongues. Woo! Glory, glory. And many are off to foreign fields with the gift of the language. Yes. Glory, glory, glory. He is using even the children to preach his gospel. A young woman, age 14 years old, who is saved, sanctified and baptized with the Holy Ghost, went out and took a band of workers with her. And she led a revival where over 190 souls were saved. Glory Hallelujah. The altars in San Jose are crowded day and night. Twelve have received their Pentecost and are speaking in tongues. Devils are being cast out. And the sick are being healed. All the glory to God. Amen. Glory, glory. In Chicago, there are a number of Pentecostal meetings. Glory to God. And many are magnifying God for the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Woo! My God, my God. Orca from Denver. Forty souls have received the baptism and are speaking in another language. Yeah. One of them, a woman who was crippled for 32 years, was brought in. And the six-year-old girl who was filled with the Spirit, she walks up to this lady, yeah. puts her hands on her, My and God. As she says, Jesus wants to heal you. Yeah. So the Spirit has sent me to put my hands on you. Yeah. She immediately arose and walked. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Toronto. Anybody know where Toronto is? In Toronto, a number have received the baptism. Brother Adams went there from Los Angeles. He told them what God had done in Azusa Mission and other places. And they went right to Tarion before God. Now, a company stayed after the meeting to pray through. And the Spirit fell. And three of them were baptized with the Holy Ghost. The Pentecost has crossed the water over to the Hawaiian Islands. A brother in Honolulu received the Pentecost by hearing of God's word through the papers. Hallelujah. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is falling on the humble in Gothenburg, Sweden. Yes. They had a prayer meeting and they saw fire. And four persons were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues. But let me tell you, they praised God until 5 o'clock in the morning. Hey! My turn. Listen, listen. I got a letter from brother and sister Carl. They were in Hong Kong. That's the last report. God is using them blessedly, and a glorious revival is breaking out. Let me, let me tell you, let me tell you. Several souls in Hong Kong have received their Pentecost. My God, today. A band of 14 missionaries went to Japan and China and they were able to talk to the Chinese and the Japanese at the dock and on the ship in their native languages. A number have received the baptism and they are hungry for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We rejoice. The Pentecost has fallen thousands of miles away all over the world. Let me tell you, we got letters from India, China, Germany, Switzerland, England, Ireland, Australia, all from hungry souls who are craving Pentecost. Let me tell you, the world is ripe for Pentecost, and God is delivering it. Amen. Jesus was too large for the synagogues. He preached outside because there was no room for him inside. This Pentecostal movement is too large for just one denomination or sect. It works outside and it draws those together in one bond of love, one church, and one body of Christ. Amen. The Pentecostal power, when you sum it all up, it is just more of God's love. Yes. If it doesn't bring more love, it is simply 
a counterfeit. God doesn't need a great theological preacher that will give nothing but theological chips and savings to people. Amen. He can pick up a worm and thrash a mountain. He takes the weak things to confound the mighty. He is picking up pebble stones from the street and polishing them up for his work. Glory to God. Who am I speaking to today? So many of us are worshiping in the mountains. Big churches, stone and frame buildings. But Jesus teaches us <laughs> that our salvation is not in these structures, not in the mountains, not in the hills, but in God. Woo, Lord. And glory. Wherever God can get a people that will come together in one accord and one mind in the word of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost will fall upon them. Glory. Glory, glory. Jesus said, <laughs> he that believeth in me, <laughs> glory, as the scripture has said, out of his inmost being shall flow rivers of living waters. Praise God for the living waters today that flow freely, for they come from every Every, they come from God to every hungry and thirsty heart. Hallelujah. Amen. Then we are able to go out in the mighty name of Jesus to every hungry, thirsty, part, sad, and lonely heart. We'll be able to believe and receive the Holy Ghost until they know that the Savior, woo, the Savior is here. Praise God for the living waters today. Who am I speaking to today? Praise God for the living waters today. We want the river. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 18. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Mm. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Oh, Lord. In these last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit yes, on all people. Yes. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Amen. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit yes. in these days, and they will prophesy. Let's sing. Oh, spread the tidings round.
singing um, between 1906 and 1909 tens of thousands of people flocked to Azusa Street to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit they left with a message of Pentecost and evangelistic zeal to share it with the world reaching more than 50 nations within two years by 1980 six percent of all global Christians were Pentecostal charismatic by 2015, 25% of all global Christians are Pentecostal charismatic. Mm -hmm. yes. Today, approximately 800 million, 800 million charismatic and Pentecostal Christians trace their roots to the Azusa Street Revival. Yeah, right. yes, right. What you heard today, 98% of it, it was the actual words of the people that were there. We wanted to faithfully just present their testimony this morning. And I've been... I've been steeped in this stuff for about five or six months now and church i want i want to experience what they experience i don't know about you but i want revival anybody else in this place want to experience a revival i certainly do i certainly do i certainly do and and this is what the lord has sort of impressed upon my heart what did these people have what made them so special i mean it was incredible 1906 multiracial community, interracial. They, they, you know, there were blacks, there were whites, there was Asians all together in a time in the, in the United States when that wasn't supposed to be happening. Right, right. There was female pastors, women in leadership. I mean, yeah. it, it blows my mind. I'm reading 1906. Are you sure it's not 2006? That's right, yeah. But when the Spirit of God falls, incredible things happen. I, I, I am so excited for what God could potentially do in my generation. Yeah, come on. In my generation, never mind 1906, I want God to pour out a spirit in a way that a hundred years from now they're going to be saying, what? That happened in 2020? That happened in the year of COVID? What? <laughs> there are three kinds of Christians. This is what the Lord has been putting on my heart for a little while. Who experiences revival? There's this first kind, and we've all been there. We make a decision to follow Jesus, right? There's a decision. It starts with a decision, but some believers, they never get past the decision phase. You know, they're hanging around other Christians. They're even coming to church, but there's never a deeper, deeper involvement. You know who made a decision for Jesus? This is what the Lord spoke to me, and I know it sounds kind of harsh, but Judas made a decision for Jesus. Yep. Judas decided to follow Jesus, yep. and he followed him around for a long time. Couple of years, saw amazing things, but at the end of the day, he never developed a devotion. He never went, to, he betrayed him. When the going got tough, he said, nah, this is not for me. And unfortunately, there are some Christians that are like that. You make a decision, but you never reach that, you, you never get to revival. Yeah. You never get to the second level of Christian, which is devotion. Most of us are devoted, are we not? And that's a good place to be. I count myself in this category. I am devoted to the Lord. I, I can say that without ego, without arrogance. I, I, you know, I want to know more about Jesus. I spend time in my Bible every day. I pray. I, I, I'm, I'm hungry to know more about God. I, I am devoted to Him. Our, I, and I believe most Christians are there. But here's the thing. Most Christians are devoted, but they never experience revival. They never get to, you know why? And this is what the Lord has really been speaking to me, because there's a third level. Yep. There's desperation. Come on. Yep. There's a level of believer that are desperate. Yeah. And when you, when, you, when you steep in these stories, right. when you read the words of these people, they were desperate. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't just devoted to Jesus. They weren't, it was like the New Testament. If you look at who Jesus is healing, it's the people that are desperate yeah, to get healed. Yeah. If you look at who he's delivering, it's the people who are desperate yeah, to be delivered. Yeah. If you're looking at who's forgiven of their the worst sins, it's the people yeah. who are desperate to repent. Come on, come on. They were desperate to repent. Yeah. They were desperate to repent. Yeah. They talked about sanctification all the time, this thing where I want to be holy Jesus. now. In the, they were desperate for holiness. They were desperate for the Spirit. That's they were right. desperate to know that's God. Right, and right. church, I think this is what's missing from my own life. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm not going to speak for you. I don't know where you're at, but I see, I think that the, the church in general could use a little more desperation Come because on. we're living in Come desperate on. times, are we not? Yeah. Yeah. The world is desperate. We need to get a little desperate. We need to get, let me, I've been learning about revival, I've been, all week long I've been watching footage from revival of the 90s, and can I just turn it for a second to the millennials, to the teenagers, to Generation Z. It is your turn. My God. It is oh my your God. turn. My God. Listen to me. Get desperate. Yeah. Forget about the stupidity. Forget about the Instagram. Forget about the Facebook. You're desperate about things that don't matter. Get desperate about eternal things. Get desperate about Jesus, and you will see something incredible happen in your generation. They will be talking about this generation. You old people, get desperate for the young people. Get on your knees and start calling out to God. Say, Lord, pour out your spirit. Pour it out, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. I'm not... A I don't mean to get this big and crazy, but I can't help it today. Yes. Church, this is what I believe with all my heart. This morning, there's an invitation. God is inviting us to taste more of His Holy Spirit. On, yeah. Young people especially, I, I have it on my heart. I'm burdened with this. God wants to fill you with His Holy Spirit. Lord. God wants to turn you into war horses this morning. Make some changes. Get desperate. He wants to baptize you with His Holy Spirit. He wants to take you out of the realm of just intellectual knowledge and into the realm of the spirit of the power of God. Paul was brilliant. He was a genius. But he said when he went to preach the gospel, what did he depend on? The power of God, not his many words and his wisdom and all that great stuff. So this morning... If, join me. I stand here with you, and I'm getting up, and I'm saying, Lord, I want to be desperate. Put yeah. a desperation into my heart Amen. for the things of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to be desperate to turn away from the things that are in the way and desperate for your gospel. Yeah. Amen. Stand with me if you want to join me this morning. Amen. If you want to go beyond decision, if you want to go beyond devotion, and you want to go desperately into the arms of Jesus, do it. If you're watching at home, I've got news for you. The Azusa revival started in a living room. It didn't start in a church. You can get up out of the chair you're sitting in right now, and you can start seeking the Lord. Get on your knees, cry out to Him, call out to Him, get desperate, and God will meet us. Hallelujah. We will see great and mighty things in the name of Jesus. Call out for the baptism. Right now, I want to give an opportunity to call out for it. If you want more of the Spirit of God, don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of that thing. You think, some of you think you're going to have to leave something behind, and that's why you don't want, because you're, you're afraid that God is going to tell you to leave something behind that you really like. It is not worth it. It's trash. I want to tell you right now, it is garbage compared to his presence, compared to the calling and the power and the glory he wants to bestow on you. You are called to be a history maker, a world changer. Father God, we stand before you this morning, humbly. We stand on your word. We ask that we might, Father God Almighty, taste and see in our generation your goodness, your grace. The world is in trouble everywhere we look, Father God Almighty. Everywhere we look, there is need. And a lot of us, we feel, Father God Almighty, scared. We feel like we can't. But God, is, God, you are the God who does. And I'm saying this morning, God, pour out your spirit on the hungry. Give us a desperation in our heart. Hallelujah, Father God Almighty. We love you. We praise you. And we seek you, Holy Spirit. We want more. We want more, Lord. We want more, Lord. We want more than religion. Hallelujah. We want the living waters as we yes. set in this play, Father God Almighty. Yes. Gracious God, Father, we love you so much. Amen. And we give you thanks for what you are going to do in every hungry and desperate heart. To you be all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, and all the blessing, Father. Have your way with us. Church, we're going to end this service in a moment, but listen to me. It's not done. It's not done. This week, get hungry. God is good, and he wants to give us good things. Pray for revival. Seek his face, and watch the incredible things that he will do in Jesus' name. Listen to me also. You can't do it alone. The church is here. We're not closed. Call us. Call a pastor. We'll put you in a small group. We're going to connect you with other people. If you need to grow deeper, we will help you. I will help you. Email me. I'm going to help you get desperate. You help me. We need each other. Yeah. 
all right? This is a battle. Soldiers need one another. Let's do it. Let's see great things for Jesus. Let's do great things for Jesus. Let's be what he wants us to be. Hallelujah. Revival come in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you guys. Praise.